So I'm going to start letting people in. Welcome everyone, just going to leave this for a minute before we start presenting so that folks can join in. All right, I'm sure more will continue to join as we get started, but uh, in the interest of keeping everyone's time focused, um, thanks everyone for joining. This is um, our third, I think, of these webinars that we've been running and our attempt, our goal to start was to run these on a quarterly basis. Uh, last year we did one and we fell down a little bit and uh, we were too busy to really keep them going. Uh, we did one in, um, I think January-ish, and then we did one in December last year or November, and we're now, en route to stick the quarterly plans, uh, starting with this one. So uh, thanks everyone for joining and thanks to the dev leads for um, making some time for this. Uh, essentially what we want to do is we want to um, present an ongoing view of what's happening very informally. Let some of you folks um, uh, interact with some Q and A's. So please feel free to uh, ask questions if you've got them and uh, we'll try and keep an eye on, on what people are asking as we, as we present. Um, without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce our dev leads, which are myself uh, on infrastructure. We've got Pali Bacheco on uh, workflow, Bojana Bokan on, on uh, uh, metadata, and Devika does UI UX, and we've got Yarda on uh, UI. Um, so we'll have a bit from each of these folks, uh, and I'll start. And I just want to give a quick update on the um, overall view of the roadmap. And I, I did presented about this last time. Of course, we had the holidays, and so not a lot has changed since then. But just in the interest of keeping everyone informed about uh, what our overall roadmap is, I'll talk a bit about 3.4.0, which was released last year, and 3.5.0, which is coming next. So with regard to 3.4.0, um, we have, uh, well, 3.3.0 and 3.4.0. Those are our two maintained branches of OGS, 3.3.x being the um, LTS version of the software, long-term port and 3.4.0 being the non-LTS release of the software, but with a few newer features and on a kind of more rapid upgrade cycle. Um, the last dev leads presentation, again, I think that was in November, we had 3.0.16 and 3.4.0.4 as our current releases. And those are still current. We've not released anything since then, but we will release 3.0.17 and 3.4.0.5 this quarter. And there are two issues there that uh, should um, you know motivate the, the the release being sooner later? There's success fixes, um, cross site scripting, and some template uh, Now that we're introducing more um, more Vue JS, um, nothing that's going to be on fire. But when the releases do come out, it'd be a good idea to update those when you uh, get the chance. There's also a lot of translation work um, in this release, and this is purely due to the thanks to our our translator community who've been um, working away on on translation content in Weblate. Um, just over the months. And you know, occasionally I'll check and see what languages have showed up. The list is always very impressive. And uh, we're seeing a lot of languages come in that we've just never seen before, um, which is really gratifying to see our kind of work spreading out through the world. And as usual, with any minor release, we'll have a number of kind of, you know, maybe a dozen or two uh, minor tweaks and fixes. So um, good to stay up to date. Um, again, the if you're using anything older than 3.3, if you're using 3.2 or older, I really encourage you to update to 3.3, the LTS version, or if you're capable of um, following a faster release cycle, the non-LTS version is 3.4.0. Um, if you're using 3.3.0, then updating to the most recent release of that version is very straightforward. Just unpack the newest code. No need to run a database update, although you can if you want. Um, and likewise for 3.4.0. So it should be quite easy to stay up to date with those. Um, talking about 3.5.0 in the future. So the planned release of 3.5.0 is the fourth quarter of this year. That's feeling okay. 
Um, we're working on pretty much everything big that needs to go into it. Um, it is complex work and uh, the months are going to go by pretty quick. So I want to keep an eye on that release date to see if it stays uh, realistic. But so far, I'm feeling good about it. Um, the 3.5.0 release will be designated as an LTS release. And uh, that'll happen sometime after it's kind of first put out there. So keep an eye out for that as well. And then you'll have a long window of time to update from 3.3.x, the current LTS, to 3.5.x. Um, so some major features of 3.5.0, and I'm recycling this slide from last time, so it'll be nothing new here. The major feature is uh, a rework of submission lists. We've known for a long time that those are the most complex part of the system in that you have to summarize a very large amount of information from various corners of the system in order to give the editor in chief or the editors or whatever your organizational structure is, a, a good enough overview of the content in the system that they know where they have to go to do their work um, while also still having it be performant. And uh, Vitaly will talk a bit later about that. Another major feature is the integration of ORCID and credit into the software. And this is following a, a path that we've been um, talking about for some time now. When we first integrate a third party service or, or standard or what have you, if we're not sure about the future being, you know, the leading uh, standard in a certain way, um, we'll implement it as a plugin. And that means that if there's competing plugins or comp competing integrations for the, for the feature set, we can have them live in parallel. But at a certain point, um, we're sure that that this feature, this standard, is the way that the uh, scholarly publishing community is going to move ahead. And that's the case with ORCID and Credit. Plugins can integrate to a certain degree um, where they're they're useful, they're separately maintained, and they do the job. But especially for things like UI UX, it's really hard to make a plugin as smooth as a built-in feature. So starting with 3.5, we'll be building ORCID and Credit both into the system. Um, and particularly in the case of Credit, that doesn't mean it's perfect. We actually did a lot of work during a couple of sprints recently talking about the limitations of Credit. Um, it's a bit like you know, Dublin Core having the core fields that are so general that they're, they apply universally, but they're almost less useful because they're so general. I think credit suffers from them, some of the same uh, same issues. But we see that Orchid's adopting credit. Uh, JATS has good support for credit. Uh, Crossref is talking about credit. It's the leading contender for this. And um, the when we did our, our sprint work, for example, we looked at the alternatives to credit, and some of them had you know 160 different classifications for kinds of contribution. They went overkill in the opposite direction. So much like with Dublin Core versus other standards, um, we have to strike a balance and credit is clearly it. So building those in. Um, the third major feature is a home for JATS documents. And this is a relatively small feature. I'll present a bit more about this later. Uh, another major feature is, and this is mostly thanks to the uh, the CraftOA initiative and our, our partners at TIB and the Finnish Federation of Learning Societies, um, invitation tools and GDPR improvements for OJS and OMP and OPS. Um, there's some tools for editorial board management. Uh, we used to have this in OGS2, uh, where you could designate who your editorial board was. Um, and we removed that for OGS3 because it didn't really have a strong purpose and it wasn't all that well designed. Um, for 3.5, we're going to be introducing, introducing features like this again for the sake of the Integrity Initiative, which is um, a project that we're working on that's uh, generously grant funded uh, through a donor, actually, um, that's looking to provide more standard tools for increasing the clarity on the trustworthiness of the journal and editorial board is part of that as well. And then finally, some multilingual metadata improvements, which uh, again are primarily coming through CraftOA and our, our folks and friends there. Um, just to say a bit more about this basic support for JATS, because this has recently been merged into the main branch for release in 3.5. Um, as I say, it's a relatively small feature code-wise, but um, a really big piece of our XML strategy, which again, I'll speak a bit more about in a minute. Um, essentially, it adds a new JATS XML tab on this uh, this workflow sidebar, where previously we really had no place for the JATS document to live. Uh, you can upload the document, you can download the document. Um, that's all fairly straightforward. But one piece that's um, interesting about this is that it raises the profile of our uh, kind of JATS generation tools, which for the sake of metadata are, are used in production with um, projects like Ocean Publica, for example but I uh, do not yet include the, the body text of the, the document. So you can see here, this metadata is actually not in a file at all. It comes directly from the metadata fields we've got here. And this document is generated on the fly currently. And if you're operating things in that mode, then at the bottom of the document, you have a note here to say, this is uh, generated automatically. Now, if you were gonna be working with uh, JATS from a third party, you would up upload a separate document and that would then become uh, what you'd see presented here. 
this is going to become the kind of nexus of um, a set of tools that work on JATS. Um, we've had no real need for this until just recently um, because OGS was very hands-off with the content you were uploading to it. But I think at this point, we really want to move forward our JATS strategy. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and this is a good starting point for it. So starting with 3.5, there's a place for your JATS document to live. Any external services that work with the JATS document can work with it knowing where to find it. And if you're working with a third-party service, for example, there's API endpoints to upload that document. And uh, uh, credit to uh, Dimitris on our team for doing this coding. Um, so uh, I mentioned the XML working group and um, our XML story is a long one um, and a bit complicated. Uh, we did uh, have an XML strategy over the years and it mostly centered around having a JATS editor. And we've taken a number of kicks at this. Uh, our, our kind of two main challenges with JATS are getting the content into JATS format. And so that's transformation. And then once you have it there, how to work with it, how to edit it. And our, our goal is to make this a toolkit that's um, not going to require a lot of expertise and a lot of expert labor, because that's the problem with XML currently. They do require too much of that. You either have to rely too heavily on your, your team to work in the production of the content, or you've got to outsource it to places that do that work for you, which is not achievable or scalable necessarily. So we relaunched our XML working group in November, roughly last year, accepting that a JAS editor like Texture, like Libero, that we've been kind of waiting for from the community is just not going to fall from heaven. I think there's good reasons that JATS editors have not kind of uh, started to spring up um, in a way that's kind of commodity like HTTPS. So the question is, without an editor, how do we approach JATS in OJS? And we're working on that right now. Um, how should it be resourced? Uh, which is, of course, a, a big challenge. It's um, very front-end uh, centric, that kind of work. So a lot of cutting edge JavaScript uh, type um, implementation is required. And we don't necessarily have like a huge history of that on our team, although we are growing that part of it. Um, around full text to work with it. Uh, do you work with the HTML or the XML, the JATS directly? And uh, again, accepting that an editor is not going to come to us necessarily. Do we move towards HTML instead of uh, the JATS natively? And then do we transform between the HTML and the JATS? Uh, when we're talking about JATS, which JATS do we talk about? And uh, uh, we've been over this many times with a number of partners. It's such a big standard. There's a need for it to be treated in a subset form um, so that we know what we can expect rather than trying to have a tool that works with everything and then misses the mark. Um, so the goal is to establish a clear path for a JATS-based workflow in OJS, building on that feature I just showed you a screenshot of. And uh, we are working towards it um, very pragmatically, I'll say. And uh, it's, I got to say, from my perspective, it feels really good to be working on this again, as opposed to having it shelved, waiting for something uh, to appear from the community that's been very slow to appear, because we've been kind of um, a bit powerless to move it forward. And uh, we do have a lot of good tools out there that are, are in existence and that are, that are being used in, in publication, in production. And uh, to just string together a chain of those and make some concrete decisions Maybe not trying to do everything for all people, but to make a, a pathway forward for the community is super important to us. Uh, I'm going to mention this grant here, and this um, it's called OSSORE, and ORE is Open Research Europe, and OSS is Open Source Software. This has been keeping us very busy the last uh, about six weeks. Uh, we've been aware that there's been this um, uh, application uh, coming open for uh, for a while. Um, and it came at us in, I think, mid-December. Um, and essentially, it's there's this existing Open Research Europe platform, which is based on F1000, um, which is very, um, it really embodies the, the open science uh, um, uh, goals, basically, around open review and early publication, all that sort of thing, which are all subjects that are very um, important to us, but we haven't been able to move forward on as, as quick as we'd like. Um, so when this came to us, it was of great interest because uh, it aligns well with the goals that we know we need to meet, but may provide some resources for us to be able to uh, to do the implementation work. Um, I'm not going to say a ton about this uh, because I, I believe at some point they're going to open the bids and I don't want to get ahead of any of that stuff. But essentially, we put in a bid for this. The, the window for the bid closed um, on the end of January, so literally <laughs> uh, last week, basically. Um, so we got that submitted and... Um, it's got, uh, it's got a little list here of things that it touches on. It touches on um, a preprint workflow in OJS and kind of blurring that boundary between preprints and published content, which OJS has always been very much about published uh, articles and OPS has been about preprints. And um, we're seeing services out there that kind of make 
early access uh, possible are clear about the status of an article, but then let it evolve through open science, um, open reviews, that sort of thing into a journal article whereupon it then becomes formally published um, all within the same platform. And that's uh, a thing we've heard here and there is of interest and we'd like to, to tinker with ourselves. Um, thematic content organization, and this goes hand in hand with um, the blurred line between uh, preprints and submitted articles. Um, if you're no longer doing kind of issue-based publication and you're doing uh, early publication or the early posting of content, then the issue is no longer the unit of organization. It becomes more about um, thematic organizations, for example. And this, this platform's got some interesting approaches to that as well. Um, and then of course, single source. And I just talked about uh, JATS XML and our challenges there. Um, this has a requirement for us to, um, should we win the bid uh, to, to implement uh, single source publishing essentially. And the existing platform they've got does that quite well. So it's a good chance for us to really sharpen our, our, our knives and forks and, and look at this from a very practical standpoint, as opposed to our usual challenge, which is that we have such a broad community out there um, that it's hard for us to make uh, decisions in a really specific way because we're trying to kind of please all, all comers. And in this sense, um, working towards a, an existing platform and working towards um, a very clear set of requirements gives us some really good decision-making tools. Um, happy to say more about this. Um, if anyone's curious, please do reach out to us. And uh, we've got our fingers crossed this comes through. And um, yeah, it's letting us hopefully move forward on things that are of great important to, importance to us already. And I was very pleased to see that um, this was written in a way that was well informed by what it means to be open source, uh, the good and the bad, and also who the various platforms are that uh, they've assessed. Uh, they did some very good study on that as well. Uh, so one little idea that we had uh, that we were just kicking around, this is mostly Devika and I, for example. Um, one requirement that this platform has that we um, have had come to us from other folks as well is um, a bit of flexibility around the workflow. And um, we've talked about, we've called this internally flexible workflow as a concept. We thought about how we can tear apart the, the stages of the submission process in OGS, the workflow it goes through into recombinable components. So right now, OGS has submission, review, copy editing, production. Um, and it's very fixed uh, the way that that fits together. And uh, we've kind of bumped up against this problem when we've tried to tease that apart, um, which is that a lot of systems need to know what state something is in. And if you've got this mix and match workflow where it could really be configured any way the editor wants it to be, it's very hard to tell an external system what, st what stage something is in. Now, the uh, workflow proposed for OSSORE included um, a number of checks and uh, uh, steps to be accomplished at, at existing stages in the workflow. And in fact, we found that the, the list here we've got, submission, review, copy editing, and, and production, is a really good uh, mental model for what a submission goes through in any kind of um, publishing system. And so rather than tearing that apart and allowing kind of chaotic recombination of stages, we thought, well, what about taking uh, each stage's work and allowing for better management of workflow within that? And what we imagined is taking the existing discussions tool, which is a, a, a chance to um, capture communication about the workflow um, between different users on a stage uh, using email templates and, and, and so on, um, taking that discussion tool and expanding it into a general task management tool. And so we kicked around a few screenshots and we thought this had great promise. And this really builds on uh, the work that uh, Vitaly, for example, has done uh, since 3.3 on mailables, uh, basically to allow for uh, multiple email templates to be written for a particular task. And then when you're performing that task, you can select which template you want out of a list. And so we're kind of continuing to expand upon that. If you haven't seen that feature, um, I think it's underexplored and shows a ton of potential. And it might well be that we then base something like this, like this upon it. So just an idea that we're kicking around as an example. Um, we, uh, we have this habit when we are doing uh, estimates and grants and so on of getting maybe a little over specific. <laughs> and um, part of that stems from wanting to know that we uh, understand what we're committing to when we commit to it. Uh, but it means that we uh, we generate all these materials like mock-ups and, and design ideas and so on in the course of doing an estimate and a proposal. And um, uh, then we have those hopefully ready to go when we're, when we're uh, able to start. Um, I'm going to pass on to Yarda, and he's going to talk a bit about a number of different UI, UI uh, sorry, front end and UI uh, aspects he's been working on. This is going to be very useful for us uh, internally, but also within the community. We've been already um, using these to shape some design work uh, that we're doing with uh, with um, other groups. So Yarda, if you're able to unmute and uh, take over, I'm happy to operate the slides for you. Just let me know when you want to advance.
Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Yarda. I joined, joined the team last year in May. And as I mentioned, my responsibility is mainly building new UIs, but also advancing the techniques and the guidelines, how we do it. So it, um, you know, on this, we get focused more on these technical uh, parts rather than new features, hopefully more on new features next time. And one, uh, first of all, I would like to mention that there is um, plenty of the links uh, in, in the slides uh, because there is quite a lot of to cover. And some of these topics will really be interesting for you. Some of these, not at all, uh, if you are not a developer, for example. So uh, please uh, explore these links. Some of them uh, takes you to the more detailed documentation to the storybook. Some of them take you to the GitHub example. So you can see how it looks in the practice. Some of them takes you to the uh, official documentation of the projects uh, that we are using. So uh, first uh, bigger topic I want to start this is the storybook. So to set up the context, uh, we can go to the next slide. And on the screenshot, you can see the documentation tool that we have been using for a couple of years. It has been built in house by Nate. And main purpose was the documentation uh, of the components, but also was useful during the development cycle. And the storybook is open source tool, which we want to replace it with. And now I will be basically trying to explain why we would spend time on something like that. Um, and if you go to the next slide, like, and then you can see a screenshot of the storybook. So you can kind of get very similar feeling. So purpose of this tool in uh, in uh, basics is very similar. And so now I will basically spend the rest of the slides trying to convince you why uh, we would move to the storybook. And so let's go to the next slides where we have some points on it. So uh, first thing is uh, basically that the storybook is like very long-term project, which is open source and it was adopted by many projects and it has its own ecosystem, which we don't have to maintain. So um, even when we are updating some of our dependencies, it means that we have to you know, improve and update our tooling as well. So one of the benefits, obviously, is just moving uh, to the tool, which is well established in the community. And that kind of leave a little bit more uh, time for uh, building the features. Then uh, it, it, interesting thing is that Storybook is already on version 7. So they spent lots of time on actually improving the developer experience. Uh, so they came up with the concept of the stories, which have now very uh, well thought out uh, syntax and has a lot less boilerplate compared to the documentation tool uh, we had. Also, it gives you like um, nice features, like it's able to extract some of the documentation from the code. So if we create a documentation inside our Vue.js component, it's able to pick it up, uh, not just the type of the properties, for example, but also the documentation uh, and description of, of, these, of these properties. So, uh, I basically migrated the these descriptions inside the code, so it's just in one place, and it doesn't matter if you are exploring the component in in the storybook or if you are exploring that directly in the source code. You will see the same descriptions uh, in both cases. Um, another uh, feature uh, that our tool uh, didn't have was basically simulating the API communication with our backend. And uh, that's very useful when uh, when we are building sometimes even like simple components, which uh, uh, in some cases when we have like autocomplete uh, components that need to make a API request to the backend to actually get the list of the uh, you, you know uh, items for auto search, then um, you, you know having these. Uh, capabilities there will make it a lot easier. So we can define basically uh, what are the responses to different API calls. Mm -hmm. So th this is on component level, but also when we are building uh, the pages, uh, which consists you know, of all these components, then 
it's possible to do now a lot more like independent UI development directly in the storybook where we can simulate the responses from the API. And that allows, you know, to advance that work uh, separately in the storybook, even before the API do exist. Or, uh, or sometimes it's uh, useful even just for prototyping. So it hel actually helps to shape what the API for that page should look like. Um, uh, another useful uh, functionality is uh, that it's easy to write user interactions uh, in, in, in the code. So uh, at this point, uh, during the migration, I basically use it only for opening models. So if you open in like the co model components, it will automatically click on the button to open them. So you see the, uh, the, the interaction, the, the animation. But it opens a lot more possibilities uh, to basic to basically also do some of the functional testing on the on the component level. Um, <clears throat> uh, to be fair, one thing I wanted to mention that during the development, I had one uh, instability issue that's still been un unresolved. There is work around how how to deal with it, but. You know, uh, compared to our old tools, it's a lot more complex. Therefore, sometimes it's, you know, misbehaves a little bit. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's open source. So maybe if it doesn't get fixed, maybe we can uh, spend a little bit more time to contribute there. <clears throat> and, but these are like, e e even though all, all these features I mentioned are nice to have, and I think will be useful, the biggest thing that why I decided to actually spend time on, on this migration was the visual testing. And that will take us to the next slide. Uh, so um, I work on di different uh, user interface, uh, you know, projects before and visual testing became like very important part of it. What the visual testing is, is basically that part of your automated tests, um, it also creates screenshots. And these screenshots are automatically stored and compared to the new ones. So it helps to basically uh, confirm what the actual UI looks like. For example, we already have very good um, test coverage with our uh, Cypress test. But these are all like functional tests. So currently there is, if the layout completely breaks down, these tests uh, doesn't catch it. So I was looking uh, for a way how to introduce uh, at least to some degree visual testing. And the storybook is very, uh, uh, is probably the best tool for it, where we can get lots of value with relatively low effort. And that's always what we, what we want because we are always short on the resources. And the thing is that in storybook, we already want to have it as a documentation tool. So we can see all the components there in different states. And there is, and since Storybook is very like a uh, common tool that people are using, then uh, there are also services that are built on top of Storybook where you can basically uh, send your Storybook and they will basically go through all your components, all your stories, all the states and make screenshots and, and store them. And that basically uh, help us to have this uh, you know, uh, visual coverage when where we have confidence that our components and our pages still look uh, right. Um, particularly, I would like to highlight the uh, possibility that currently we screenshot everything left to right and right to left. And I think for me, this, this was really important because I always just use everything left to right, obviously. So it, it takes time before someone actually notice if he something if he breaks something, you know, for the right to left uh, languages. And this really help us to, you know, make sure that our, you know, interfaces, you know, uh, have correct layouts for both scenarios. And I already fixed like lots of regressions that basically came from the uh, migration to view free, where I had to replace lots of the underlying libraries so, uh, and I didn't notice that it's, for, for example, regressed for the right to left um, language. So this helped me to actually, uh, you know, discover these again and, and fix them. Um, uh, what, 
one thing uh, which is also very good is that uh, with every pull request that we currently cr create against our UL library, uh, the storybook gets built, and there is directly link on the on the pull request where you can see the state of the storybook at that time. So if I need feedback from Devika or someone else from the team, it's easy to share it and see even from the pull request how things are going. And also it runs the visual testing on the pull request. So you know if you are making some changes and you can confirm whether that change was intentional or not. Um, all right, I, I, I believe I covered everything I, uh, I wanted on this one. And we, yeah, this uh, this screenshot really just uh, this is like example of the UI because we are using a service called Chromatic, which is maintaining the storybook, and they have, in my opinion, one of the best integration with the storybook testing. So, uh, and they kindly uh, offered um, uh, supporting um, uh, P PKP. Um, so this is like example where, for example, you can see that the buttons look different on the uh, image page below. And the thing right. is that if I, for example, change styling of the button, I will see how it propagates through all the UIs that are actually using uh, the button. So I can verify that this is still looks all right on every every place. And then I can just simply say, accept this change. It looks correct. Um, so this is just a sneak peek how it looks like. Uh, but also to mention uh, that um, they support basically open source workflow. So anyone can actually see the screenshots. Um, only the team can obviously confirm the changes. Uh, so if you want to check out the storybook or this chromatic UI and you don't have the slides yet, you can go to the UI library, read me, and we have the links, uh, links there. And so we can explore the storybook, we can explore the screenshots in the chromatic service. Uh, okay, uh, let's move on. Um, and uh, this, the second part of my talk will be a little bit more technical. It's um, we decided to do some of the changes, uh, how we do things, but it's not revolution, it's just evolution. Uh, and I believe it's in important direction to make sure that long term we are very well established in the Vue.js ecosystem. And so so to be able to capture it, I written this technical roadmap, which is um, available in the storybook. And uh, in this presentation, I will basically just make an overview what, what has changed. Uh, but there is plenty of links if you are a developer and these things interest you, so you can click around and uh, explore yourself as well. So uh, let's, uh, let's go through it. Um, yeah, can we go to the next one? Um, so uh, first initiative is really uh, basically on, you know, first off, just to make sure that this is clear, this is really focused on the editorial backend, which is using the Vue.js. So uh, the reader interface might require a slightly different uh, considerations and we don't use Vue.js there at all. So these really apply to that editorial backend, which obviously is a lot more complex. Um, so uh, first first thing is that as a transition from the Smarty uh, templates, uh, the basically started using Vue.js as an enrichment of the Smarty. So we can start using the Vue.js uh, components inside the Smarty templates. And that basically introduce two templates uh, or basically having one template but processed twice, once on backend side by, uh, by Smarty and then on the frontend side by Vue.js, which introduced some of the challenges that which, which I am uh, listing here. Um, and it's basically like two very similar purpose uh, tools kind of, you know, uh, fighting over who will do more, basically, a little bit. So uh, the po point here is that there were a couple of things that were easier to do in Smarty. And that was one of the reasons why we kind of probably kept it around um, a lot. And that was um, the translations. So that's something I addressed in the last um, call to basically make the translations as convenient in Vue.js as we have in the Smarty. 
And another mechanism was uh, for extending the templates uh, through uh, the template uh, template hooks. So the extensibility, that's something we can achieve with the Vue.js as well, but I'm not covering this in this talk that will come um, a little bit later. So these were like two major things that were holding us to you know, keep the smart around. But if we kind of embrace Vue.js and make you know these things work very well in Vue.js, we don't have a reason to keep smart around and we can basically simplify things and uh, yeah, not balancing what to do in smart, what to do in the Vue.js. And, you know, there are lots of differences uh, between them, uh, which people need to be aware of and careful about. So that's uh, that's one uh, thing. Uh, let's Let's go next slide. <clears throat> Um, composition API. Um, so one of the things that I did on the development uh, at the beginning of the uh, 3.5 uh, development lifecycle is basically migrating from Vue 2 to Vue 3, which was basically necessary because uh, Vue to end of the life, I think, is at the end of the last year. So we had to... Uh, move there and the major feature that the view free introduces is the composition api mm. and uh, for some time uh, i i was exploring whether this is something we want to uh, adopt or or not um at the end long story short um, we decided to start using that for uh, new components and for for new pages um, um and because and here you can see some of the reasons uh, why we uh, did that. The only downside is really that it looks a little bit intimidating at first, uh, but it compensates with how powerful it is. So it also helps us to create these composables that are basically like these small packages that you can uh, use um, uh, instead of the mixins. And that should, at the end, make the development easier and it gives a lot of power for me as a kind of as someone who is building kind of these tools to express uh, you know these uh, building blocks and underlying principles are very much the same um, and we can steep, still keep the old uh, components using the options api it's all compatible together only thing that we don't want to do is to combine uh, composition api and option api inside one component uh, but other than that, I, I believe this will set us, you know, uh, you know, in the future on the right path. Uh, I can see already that the ecosystem around the Vue.js is heavily, you know, adopting the um, composition API and the features with the options API are kind of uh, staying behind a little bit already. Um, okay, let's go to the next. Um, uh, Pinea store. So, um, so so far we have been basically maintaining the state of the application on the, on the front end inside the components inside the Vue.js components itself, and that works perfectly fine. And I normally would probably say this is perfectly sufficient. But what the Pinea stores adds uh, to the picture is is the extensibility. So we can literally use the same uh, syntax as we would use in directly in the component. So we will use the composition API, but we will, you know, just take it and move it to the Pinea store. And as a benefit, the Pinea stores does some magic and it wraps, you know, this um, business logic. So it's a lot easier to connect to it. It's a lot easier uh, to... Um, uh, explore it. It's easier to intercept uh, the changes which are happening there. So the things that we would normally do through the event buzz, which was like global and not this very clear uh, defined um, rules, this is something that Pinea can uh, do for us. That's that's what I uh, believe. Obviously, this is something that needs to be proved, uh, you know, uh, by time and by particular use cases. Um, um, but uh, it, it's part of the official Vue.js ecosystem, um, so it, it, there is very little risk of adopting it, and I believe the benefits, potential benefits, are very, very good. Uh, okay, uh, what's next? 
So everything I mentioned basically to results in some of the changes, how we structure things. So obviously if we say that we are not using Smarty anymore, then uh, the our architecture of the pages gets slightly different because now we don't have the separate Smarty template for the page, but it gets moved inside page component uh, directly in the view JS. So that's one bigger changes. And with the Pinia stores, again, it's literally just taking the business logic from the components to the store to get the benefits I mentioned. Um, and so it's, it, these are like relatively small evolutionary changes, uh, but just to make them super clear, I created the example page inside the storybook where it's well documented and, uh, yeah, there is example both in storybook and in the, in, in the code. So you can explore and see how it all comes together. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, this is just something I wanted to quickly mention that um, with the composition API, there is like the replacements for the mixins, which basically let you to extend the components with some common functionality that you want to be able to share. And so these composables, these are like the first ones that I created while I was working on the new submission listing and are basically just replacement for some of the existing uh, mixins that we already have and are just basically just a um, foundation for for our new pages because the most things you need to do you need to get data from the api so that's uh, that's the free composables that will help you with that then you need to be able to localize things that's the fourth and we had some use cases where we had to programmatically um, uh, amend some of the values in the forms. So again, rather than directly doing that in the form data structures that we have, we have this helper which uh, do it for us and it has some, you know, test coverage, for example. Uh, okay, and that's, will get us to the last uh, slide, which is, uh, which is the styling. So um, obviously we are, uh, with Devika on, on board, we are advancing also the user interface quite significantly. Um, and so I was looking for good strategy without building anything on our own that would help us to capture the design system and make it basically uh, very approachable to do the styling. <clears throat> I had a chance to work with the Tilewind CSS on some projects before, and it really just give you the right subset of the CSS styling that you can combine, which is still enough flexible, but it helps you to keep in certain boundaries. So for example, the scaling and the sizes, it really helps you to kind of um, uh, keep them consistent. So the overall layout, even if you are not a designer expert, you it's a lot more likely that your UI will look better if you use Tailwind CSS as, you know, or compare if you don't. Um, and in the storybook, uh, we captured uh, some of the things that are very specific to our designs, like like fonts, colors, shadows, radiuses. So uh, these are visible in the storybook. Uh, we can actually show it on the next slide where I just screenshot it, how it looks like. So these are just uh, screenshots from our storybook uh, where you can see, you know, uh, what classes we have uh, available for our fonts and, and colors. Um, um, one last motivation that I wanted to mention on the Tailwind CSS is that the current underlying library that we use for more complex um, components like models or combo boxes that requires lots of considerations, especially for accessibility. It's it's called Headless UI, uh, which is built um, with the intention to be easy styled with the Tailwind CSS. So there is also lots of examples to do it. So it also help us to uh, you know build these new components um, or potentially uh, adapt the styling of these components uh, you know uh, quite quite quickly. Um, yeah, this just works very well together. And I believe that was the last slide. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask them in the chat and I will keep uh, checking it. Um, and 
uh, we can uh, move to the next topic, which I think is covered by Vitaly. Yeah, thanks, Yarda. Uh, my name is uh, Vitaly Beshchenko. Uh, for the last several months, yes, I work on submission lists, and I believe last time I covered the topic of views together with Yarda. I'm work I'm working on backend part of things here, yeah, and uh, this time I was uh, I want to shortly present uh, editorial uh, editorial activity information. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a mock-up. The front end part is not cur uh, currently implemented. On the rightmost side uh, column, uh, there is information about editorial activity related to the uh, sub each submission. For example, we see circles related to review assignments, how many days, uh, for, for example, uh, overdue re uh, review assignments, or how long they are in review, etc. Uh, also, we can see that there are article where article submissions where uh, editors uh, should be assigned or reviewers, uh, and some other information. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, in short, uh, I've added uh, in our submission uh, schema additional properties uh, to. Uh, to be able to retrieve all that information it's information uh, it's property uh, which shows uh, whether editor should be assigned to the submission uh, i mean deciding editors uh, the same is for recommendations it's when uh, there are editors that can only make recommendational decisions and uh, if they give them uh, this value will be uh, true uh, the same is uh, for uh, assigned reviewers. Uh, uh, I al also added a context level variable, uh, which uh, shows uh, the recommended number of reviewers uh, who uh, ne uh, needs to be assigned uh, to the submission, to each submission. Also, information about uh, whether revisions were requested, whether authors upload, uh, author uploaded uh, uh, revision, and uh, whether uh, publication is published and in which uh, issue. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the problem Problem, the problems we encounter during uh, editorial activity implementation is performance uh, data fetching because each submission is uh, can be associated with, let's say, several review assignments in each round. Uh, also, it can be associated with several edit, uh, several uh, stage assignments uh, for each editor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, before uh, we we're trying to fetch this data on per submission basis. And now uh, all that information is retrieved in one query for all the submissions in the uh, list at once. So this, this should be much more performant than the previous implementation. And hopefully it uh, didn't require uh, much coding. Yes, that's probably uh, all the information I wanted to, uh, to share uh, on this webinar. And the next is counter report. Uh, I believe, Bozrana, uh, it's your turn. Over to you. Yes, thank you, Vitaly. Hello. Um, as you might, uh, Alec, you can go to the next slide. <laughs> As you might heard, we introduced an, uh, the counter release five in three four release, and it, it was available uh, only via Sushi API. But now we also implemented the table separated view value reports, and they will be available in the next three four zero five release. 
Uh, there are different reports for different host types uh, defined by, by a counter. That, that means uh, different report, reports for OGS, OMP, and OPS. We only assume or consider a golden open access and corresponding reports. That means that subscriptions, journals will not be able to use it, or at, uh, it will be like um, all articles are open access uh, because subscription journals would need additional tracking for each submission when the submission was uh, open access and when it was uh, 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 under subscription or when it was uh, under uh, released to be open access. So this is not what we have implemented and support. Um, and the reporting is only on the context level. The API is on the context level. And that means on journal press uh, or server uh, level. Metrics are aggregated monthly. And you can uh, choose to have a report for an institution or the world. That means uh, uh, not considering uh, for everything, so to say. And under this link, you can uh, find further information and read about Kanta Release 5 and the things you might want to know. I'll like, please, the next slide. Uh, this is an example of what reports I know just. And there are master reports and uh, so-called standard views. Master reports are customizable. They allow you to set some filters and attributes to have your own uh, uh, reports that you need. And those are like platform master report, title master report and item master report in OGS. And standard views actually pre-filtered uh, uh, master reports. There you cannot set the, the filters and attributes already defined by counter. I think you can go to the next slide. Uh, this is an example of the item master report and what settings are there. What can you, uh, what filter and attribute, attributes you can define. All reports, also standard view, will need start and date and the uh, custom ID. And it means uh, institution or the word world um, is set earlier. And then you can uh, choose the metric types you would like to have. The, the attributes you would like to see in the reports, the columns that you would like to see. You can filter them by year of a publication or submission ID, include the journal details or exclude the monthly details and have only the totals. This is just an uh, example. And then the next slide, please. This is example when the table separated values report is downloaded and inserted into uh, Excel, for example. O above is the header containing the report uh, data, uh, attributes used, uh, metric types, dates, and then uh, it's a header, header row and then the actual items uh, rows uh, by metric types. And then um, at the end, uh, the totals and monthly uh, values, the numbers. So um, yes, that's pretty much it. Just the information about this new functionality or feature. I think I'll like the ne it's next slide. Yeah, thanks, Bojan. Like... And we're coming up on the hour. So I'm going to see if I can make sure that we cover a few questions. Just to say we have uh, one upcoming event here. We at least have one more event later in the year that I don't think we're ready to release details on, but um, keep an eye out for that. But we do have an event, uh, May 13th to 14th, um, a sprint and a half day conference in association with the Library Publishing Coalition. Um, so registration details on that will be available very soon. And stay tuned for more events to be announced as well. We'll have more of that soon. Uh, I believe uh, we have a few questions here and I've been relayed those by Famira. So thanks, Famira. Um, we just have a few minutes and they're big subjects, so I'll do my best. But um, uh, please watch the video will be posted from this this talk on YouTube and it'll include links to the 
uh, all the, the slides, and then you can uh, follow up on the links that are shared there as well. Um, and I'll try and get these, these out actually in advance next time so you can follow along if you like, because it's a bit tough to track down afterwards. Um, we had a couple questions on XML. And again, big subject, so I'll try and uh, uh, speak to this very quickly, but feel free to follow up on the support forum or in comments on the YouTube videos, and we'll make sure that we respond to those. One question is about um, whether we're far targeting uh, JATS XML or whether we'll accept other schemas like TEI or BITS, which is extended JATS. Um, the feature that I showed you earlier is JATS centric, and so it, you know it should be JATS. As at the moment, the integration between OJS and that document will accept any XML document. But as we start to build in a bit more workflow tools around it, uh, it will be more JATS specific. And that preview that you saw generated from the XML. That's actually generated right now via a plugin called the JATS template plugin. And at the moment, you could as easily write a TEI template plugin that would then take the OGS metadata, transform it into a TEI document that presented on that tab. Uh, before we recommend anyone do that, though, I would suggest uh, speaking with us to see kind of what your workflow is, because I think at some point we're going to have to choose whether we're focusing on JATS and to some extent, what JATS dialect. I think something like JATS bits may always be possible to have as an add-on um, because you know the fundaments of JATS will be the same, but there's some additional uh, content that you can put in JATS bits, for example. Um, but I, I wouldn't want anyone to kind of um, subvert this feature for TEI when there's maybe another approach we could recommend for the folks that do use TEI. Um, in our community, the folks that we speak with are on, on XML and single source publishing. There is an emphasis on JATS and um, one of the reasons for that is because indexing seems to be quite uh, JAT centric and moving more that way. And not to say that there are folks who don't index in TEI, for example, but um, that's where we're receiving a lot of our, our push. In the discussion about um, uh, workflow, we've actually talked about de-emphasizing JATs as the kind of native format in favor of OGS metadata and uh, the body text in a subset of HTML. And that HTML then gets transformed to and from JATs when we need to use JATs. Um, and that would actually facilitate in cases where folks just don't have the need to or or the or the resources to work with JATs, they could simply work with the HTML content and then publish in that form and not bother themselves too much about JATs until they have a need to. And it would provide them a, a path later to, to, for example, adopt JATs if they needed to, but it wouldn't force them to. So that's one of the things that we're considering to simplify requirements, um, allow for a pathway forward but look at the breadth of community that maybe is not necessarily thinking as hard about that sort of thing. And that might also, also apply to things like TEI. Um, and that's uh, tying into the second question, which is about um, generating different formats. The transformation process from JATS to um, HTML, PDF, et cetera, uh, is one of the better traveled parts of the ecosystem. Not to say that it's not you know, got its complexities, but um, there are tools out there to do that. And so yes, we'll certainly support um, the transformation from JATS into those other tools when we get the chance to tackle this problem. Um, and hopefully the strategy, when we do articulate it more publicly, we'll, uh, we'll talk a bit about that. But there are tools out there. There's existing plugins that are you know, maintained by folks on this team and other folks as well. And there's also third-party services for things like uh, you know, template work and so on. Um, and the XML file, will that be part of the galley as well? Uh, yes, um, that's one of the requirements that the OSSORE grants, for example, or the application process. Um, specified that they would need, and it seems to be one of the principles of open science to make that document um, available as well. So I would imagine that when we tackle this, that'll be part of it as well. There was a question about Tailwind CSS on the dashboard. Any plans to migrate that to the default theme in the front end? Uh, Yaron, do you want to speak to that quickly? Yeah, this is still, uh, you know, in exploration uh, phase. Uh, in, in, in my view, the editorial part is so much different in the requirements, in the technical requirements com compared to the reader side. So overall, if you would be starting, I would say, you know, making the reader side uh, scalable with the Tailwind CSS, I think that make uh, makes sense because one of the main benefits, as I mentioned, is easier to make design that, that looks good. Um, but given all the customization that we already have, um, I would, I, I currently have no idea whether this could be a replacement at any point for the default team. If, if so, maybe it in some longer term, uh, we might consider like alternative team using Tailwind CSS. But these are still things uh, things to explore. We want to make sure that it will be, uh, you know, benefit uh, for for users, not just for the sake of you know having this technology around. 
Um, similar thing is like with the Vue.js, we keep it that for the editorial backend because it adds value there, but we can't migrate the whole thing for the reader uh, interface to the Vue.js because, for example, we can't do the server-side rendering, which is important for the optimization, search optimization. So th these are like different um, trade-offs which we have to carefully consider. So uh, to be to be uh, determined. <laughs> I think we are at the hour, so I'll wrap it at that point. But again, please watch for the video to come up on YouTube and uh, follow up with your questions there, and as always on the support forum. So uh, thanks to Dev Leads, and this is us summarizing a lot of work that the entire team has done, and not to mention just the PKP team, but the broader community as well. Translations, grant work, uh, third-party contributions. We have a lot of those as well that I'm excited to share uh, in future uh, presentations. So thanks to everyone for being part of that community. Um, I will leave it there for now. Uh, we will schedule another one of these in a few months, so watch for that. And in the meantime, I'll see a number of you on the forum and, and elsewhere. Thank you very much for joining us.